I just got back from a wedding, not mine. Uh, it was in Singapore. One of my good friends uh, from seminary, he uh, found this beautiful, wonderful lady, and he got married uh, last, last Sunday. And uh, so I got to travel to Singapore, and I had a, a great vacation. I hadn't had a vacation like that in a while. Um, there's an old, old Icelandic saying that says that a, a man that's traveling uh, who sits on a rock is, is happy twice. One when he can finally sit down, another when he can finally get back up. And uh, so it was nice to go on a vacation, but it's really nice to be back. <laughs> um, on my, the, the second leg of my journey back uh, through Shanghai, I didn't get to actually see China, I just saw it from the airport window. Um, when I got on the plane, I was really tired. It had already been a six-hour flight there from Singapore and then an eight-hour layover, <laughs> a really cheap ticket. Um, and, then, and then getting on the plane with my stuff, and I, I, I sat down in my seat, which was row 71 of 75 seat rows, and so it just was, I was way in the back near the bathrooms, and I sat down and just, just hunkered down, I put my hoodie up, and I was just ready to just zone out and go to sleep. And then I, I hear some talking behind me, and everyone is speaking Mandarin or Hokkien or something that I can't speak. And, uh, and then I feel this tap on my leg. I look up, and there's nothing. I look down, and there's this little girl. <laughs> she's not paying attention to me at all, but she's like, look, she had put her little, little tiny hand on my knee, and then she's looking under my leg at something, and very intently. And she, she's staring, and, and her, her, well, I look back, and it's her grandmother, I assume, and she's, she's talking to her, but the girl's not listening. She's got a mission, and she's, she's looking under my leg, and then she goes, I see her go back around, and just little, do -do 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 -do, like running around, and goes to the other side, and then she looks down under the, the lady on the other side of the row and on, under her legs and comes back around to my side and like, what is this little girl looking for? And the grandmother is asking questions, I assume to the same effect, what are you looking for? And the gra little girl, she's not saying a thing. And so I'd start looking around and, and I find the object of her desperate desire, an Oreo <laughs> that had rolled under the seat and had landed. But, the girl just wanted that Oreo, and I imagine a grandmother in the back who had probably given her the cookie in the first place probably had a whole package of Oreos in her, in her purse. And grandmothers, as all grandmothers do, they have all kinds of goodies in their bags. So that little girl could have asked her grandmother for probably anything but she wanted that cookie that had rolled on the floor up underneath some strange man's feet. Why was she so intent on this cookie when her grandmother probably had so much more for her? Please pray with me. God, we, we hold on to so many things. Show us what you have. Maybe, maybe give it up so we can take what you offer us. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's this story in Scripture about this, this people called the Israelites, the people of God who were, were wandering in this wilderness and this desert. Um, they were traveling down in, this, in this barren place that really didn't have any agriculture to, to sustain them and, and not enough game to, that they could, they could catch. Um, it was just was, it was barren. There wasn't, there was, even water was hard to come by. And, and they cried out to their God and said, we're going to die out here in this desert and we're hungry, we're hungry, we're hungry. And then God did this thing. He said, when you wake up in the morning, I will provide for you. 
And so they woke up that next morning and out on the, on the ground outside of the camp was this stuff that was just, just there. How did it get there and wh what was it? And they actually named it, what is it? <laughs> they, they named it, what is it? Mana, what is this? And they started scraping it off of the, off of the leaves of the, whatever was out there off the rocks, or I don't know how, it doesn't give that much description in scripture, but it says that they would gather that in the morning and they would have enough and they'd take it back home and they'd, they'd make it into cakes and, and, and into bread pieces and they'd, they'd cook it with stuff and it was very versatile, like oatmeal or flour or something like that, but it was, it was sweet to the taste, like cakes baked with honey and oil, it was, it was donuts in my opinion, and now that's the last I'll talk about food today, I think. Um, and so just this delicious, delicious food that had enough nourishment to get them through every single day, and the next morning when they, didn't ha when they had eaten everything the day before, they would be there in the morning, some more, and they'd go out there. And this happened for 40 years. As they, as they went around in this desert, God provided for them every morning this continental breakfast and lunch and dinner from this stuff, angels' food, the food of angels, they said. So Moses was leading these people through these 40 years in the wilderness, and, and Moses, um, long story, real quick, he, he was going to die. He tells the people, I'm, I won't be going with you into this land that was promised to you. I won't be going with you into this place that I've been pouring my life into getting you there. I won't be going with you into this place. But God has another leader that will take up leadership after me. So Moses he dies, and Joshua comes up. And Joshua, he, he's a different leader. He, he, he uh, has been with the, with the Israelites during this time, but now it, that he takes leadership, he's, they're, they're right, at the, right about to enter into the promised land, this land that they had been thinking about, hoping for, trusting in the promise that they would get it for 40 years and Joshua is there at this camp just before Jericho, right by the Jordan River. Can you imagine that type of anxiety that they must have had? The, 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 not in a bad way, in a good way. The promise was almost fulfilled. It's like, it's like waking, uh, uh, like going to sleep just, just before your birthday, knowing that the next day is going to be filled with family and friends and fun. And you just like, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait. So Joshua is there with the people and... and um, and that night, they celebrate Passover, the Bible says. In Joshua 5, verse 10. It's in, your, um, it's in your bulletins if you don't have your Bible with you. Joshua 5, verse 10. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. So they, they had been living in this wilderness for so long, and then, then, then they, now they're eating food that came from the earth. This is very significant. This is from the land. This is food from the land that was promised to them. And verse 12, and the manna, ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. It's this, it's this really short verse. It doesn't, uh, there's not a whole lot of detail, but it does describe that something that had been so much a stable in their life, such a miraculous blessing from God, stopped because another one, they were entered into another one, another blessing, that this, this promised land. 
for me, like manna is kind of like, the, it's, for all of us, it's this, it's, this, it's this thing that wouldn't be great to taste. I wonder what it exactly tasted like. Like what, what color was it? What, what did it feel like? What did it taste like? What could you make it into? Um, uh, that kind of wondering and, and that for that miracle to stop the day after they enter into this promised land, that must have been a little odd for them. Now they, they have to, to grow their own food. They get to pull it out of the earth and, and, and make it into stuff and then eat it. I wonder if they ever missed manna after that. I wonder if they thought, oh, it would be, I, I miss the way my mom would make manna cakes. You know, things like that. But then it stops. Have you ever, have you ever clung to something that, that God gave you before that is no longer there? Have you ever thought, boy, it would be great to get back to that, to that, that blessing when, it, when times were good, when, time, when God was doing that other thing in my life, a new thing, God doing a new thing now. There's, um, there's, this, there's this case study I want to go with you uh, through. It's found... Um, uh, in your bulletins, in uh, the story of uh, the prodigal sons, uh, the lost sons, rather. Uh, there's a story about two, two sons and a father. The, there's an older son that stays at home. He's a good son. He follows exactly what his, what his uh, father tells him to do, and he works hard in the field. And then there's the younger son, the rebellious one, the one that essentially spits in his father's face and goes off into a faraway country and just squanders his wealth. Now, these, these two sons, they're polar opposite. And the, the one that, that goes and just sells everything, gets rid of everything, he uh, just parties it up. He, he eventually is down in the dumps in his life. He has no, no, no more money. All his friends were just fair weather friends and they left as soon as he, his cash ran out. And he's sitting there in this really sad spot with some pigs and some, some slop and whatever else and, and he's hungry and he's dirty and he's, he's lonely and, and he thinks back about his father and he goes, okay, well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to tell him what a what a, how, how terrible I've been, what a, a terrible son. I'm not even a son anymore. Just make me like a slave, make me a servant because I, I don't deserve to be a son. And so he, he gets up and he goes back to the father and he, he when the father sees him, uh, you know the story, uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, the, the son, he, he, he sees his father and he's like, oh, great, he's running towards me. He's going to give me a good whipping. Um, but he's, he's wait, and the father comes up to him and he throws his arms around him. And as he does this, he's saying, oh, you know, dad, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a terrible son. I don't deserve to be your son. Make me a servant. And the father says, you're home, you're home, and starts kissing him all over, brings him into the house, has all the servants go out and throw him a party, kills the fatted calf, he makes some really good bulgogi that night, like just everything is amazing. And he, then he, he, he has this huge party in the son's honor. I wonder for that son, I wonder if that son... Remember that time when he came to his father and he had that, uh, how, how terrible he felt. I wonder if later on that night during that party, he said something to his father like, you know I don't deserve any of this. You know, I, I, I think you've got it all wrong. I, I've, I'm a really terrible son. You don't understand what I did to you. Maybe you forgot. How long has it been? Are you that old? Like, I, 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 I took half of what you own, and I spent it all, and I come back with nothing. Do you think he said these things to him? Do you think that next morning when his son is, when his father, when he wakes up and he sees his father just kind of smiling over him, like, my son's home, that he said, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm such a terrible son. I'm such a terrible son. The father did something different when he came back home. There was a change 
in, when, when the son came up, the father treated him with rejoicing, threw him a party. But the son, he had this, he had this, this repentance, this, this heart of repentance, this wanting to change his life. What if that son, for the rest of his relationship with his father, clung to how, how worthless he is, clung to how, how undeserving he is as, to be a son of the father, how, how worthless and how, how uh, disrespectful he's been? What if every time he saw his dad over, over breakfast or saying good and I, you know, dad, I don't deserve to be your son. How would the father feel? How would the father feel? What, what, would the, what, would a, what would you feel if your child, every time you met them, every time you saw them, they said, you know, you're too good to me. I, I don't deserve it. You know, forgive me for what I did to you before. Oftentimes, we come to Jesus, we come to God in prayer, and the first thing I've noticed uh, even in myself, even this morning, and I laughed to myself because I knew what the sermon was about, how how we come to him and we say, dear God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. I know that I'm a terrible person. I know that I shouldn't have done that other thing this week. I'm so sorry I didn't. Every time we come to him, and he's just ready to be there to throw us a party, to, to welcome us back, to, to tell us how much he loves us, and we tell him, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. But he wants to do a new thing with us. You know, there's the repentance that we have that when we come to God, but it's not something that we need to cling to. We, we do not uh, cling to the, the way God has forgiven us in the past because he is, he's God of the present. He already forgave us, and now our relationship continues. There's a, there's a transforming newness to our walk with God that happens every morning. He's not the God of yesterday. He's the God of today. He's the God that, that, that has forgiven and will still forgive, but that it's done. Now we're to walk with him. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in one of his books, he, he talks about um, memory. He says, you know, when two people meet that later become very, very close friends, when they meet for the first time, that first, that first meeting is a very special memory between both of them, right? It's like, oh, I remember when I met you, you had this one wingy hair thing, and you did the, you know, whatever, and they talk about that. To actually, um, that, that memory actually, of that first meeting, actually becomes something greater than the actual event, right? That as you remember that together, there is this, this growing, this, this solidarity, this, this um, value that ha is in the memory, but was not necessarily in the initial event. That if you could go back in time and experience that over again, you'd probably go, oh, that what it was like? I didn't remember that. Well, how, I don't, you know, it's different. Because that memory is more valuable now than that actual experience. The same thing it is with, with Jesus. When, when we come to Christ, the way we initially met him, that, that experience, it builds interest over time. That memory of how we were back then when we first were with the newness of faith, the newness of giving ourselves to God, that the time when we were baptized, the time we were first heard about, about the grace that he offers, when the first time when we finally got it, when it finally clicked in our experience. Those things are incredibly monumental in our walk with God, but we don't we don't try and get back there. Have you ever felt, I remember 10 years ago, I remember when I was a kid, when, when my relationship with God, we used to be like this, but now we're so far apart. We, I wish I could get back. I wish I could get back to that, that time when, when God would, I would ask and God would answer, that, that when I uh, would connect with him, I'd pray and I could feel his presence around me. It was special, 
but you've moved on. There is a relationship that is continuing to build between you and God that is different now. Because God is not a stagnant God. How often in the Bible did God ever do the same thing twice? To cross, the river, to cross a big body of water, one time he parts it, one time he, he uh, because uh, with wind, one time he does it when uh, they slap a, a robe across it, one time they step into it and it parts, and, and then later on Jesus just walks right on top of it. <laughs> like, he, it doesn't matter to him. He does, he's the God, infinite God, the God that can do anything in his bag is limitless resources, so why do we expect him to do the same thing that he's done before in our lives again in order to get back to that, that something? These, um, when we look at the, the older son, we see that he was out in the field and he comes in from his hard work in the field, in the father's field, he comes in and he sees this huge party going on and he, he knows what it's for. He knows that it's for his brother, that his, brother, his, his loser brother finally came back home. He knows that, that his father was throwing this big party and he just won't go inside. And he's upset because, because his father is doing something new for his brother. He doesn't like that God is doing something different, that we, uh, as Christians, sometimes we have people in our lives that we, we get upset because their relationship looks different than ours, that their relationship with God looks different than our own, and we get upset. Well, I don't want to participate in that. It's probably all up in their head anyway. So their, their relationship is invalidated in our minds because it's, it's something different. God is doing something different with them than with us, but we know how he works because we've got him down pat from our history. But God does a new thing. He does a new thing. In John chapter 6, um, there is a story, story later on where Jesus is uh, he had just fed the 5,000 people with bread, uh, and plus women and children. He fed them with bread and fish. And the next morning, he uh, goes, he had, he's on the other side, and some people, they find him over there, you know, uh, where's the food truck, you know? And they find him over on the other side of the lake, and they start asking him, and they say, they remember the miracle that happened the night before and the day before, and they say, you know, Jesus, um, <clears throat> how'd you get over here? It's kind of crazy. Um, hey, uh, right, so Moses, <laughs> Moses gave our forefathers manna in the wilderness. What you got? Our forefathers, the, our, our great, 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 they got manna from heaven. Can you beat that? Can you do that for us? Because we really want to taste this manna too. They must have been like me. And Jesus, he, he hears what they're saying. They're saying, could you do what you did before? That, can you do this, this amazing thing that Moses did for us and do it for us today? Because that would be really cool. That would be great. I'd love to taste that. If you do that, I'll totally believe in you. But then Jesus, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't, he says, this is the bread that came down from heaven. And he points to himself. And they're like, <laughs> that's, that's weird. And he says, you need to eat my flesh. You need to eat me. And they say, oh, this is, this is, this is different. Is this like a metaphor, Jesus? Is it? And then he intensifies it. He doesn't, he doesn't back away and say, oh, I'm actually representing something. Eat my flesh, drink my blood, or you have no part with me. And then at that point, people begin to trickle away. They go, this is a hard saying. Eat his flesh? I don't understand this. They were looking for bread. They wanted something that, they wanted this miraculous thing that God had done in the past, they wanted it to happen for them again in the present. And they asked Jesus, 
the bread of life for something to put in their stomachs. And Jesus wasn't willing to give them what would fill them in their stomachs. He wanted to give them himself, what the manna represented. The bread that came down from heaven was standing in front of them, and all they wanted was something in their hand. They were rolling around on the ground for a cookie. And he wanted to give them himself. And he wouldn't give them anything less than that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul's talking about this. He says, since Jesus died for us, verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. So because of what Jesus has done, we no longer regard people according to their according to the flesh. Uh, and even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So we, the, just like the, the people that were wanting this manna from Jesus, they looked at Jesus and they said, wow, he's a really good storyteller. Give us a story, Jesus. You know what? He's a really good teacher. Teach us a lesson, Jesus. No, he's a really good miracle worker. Do a miracle, Jesus. No, no, he's just, he's just a really good man. He's starting some big movement, you know, like do, do what you're going to do, Jesus. And they regarded him according to the flesh, what he looked like, what box they could put him in, what they could do with the, 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 the image of him. And they said, okay, do these things, Jesus. That's how they regarded him. And they, they looked at people and they said, okay, these are Jews, so they're safe. And those are Gentiles, they're, they're, they're lost. Uh, there's, there's pagans, there's, there's Romans, there's, those are oppressors, they're going to be slain. Um, and Paul is saying, now therefore, therefore meaning because Christ has died, because we are in Christ, we regard no one according to the flesh. So as people who are in Christ, who, who, who want more than just the manna, that want more, more than just this, 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 former blessing, but the current one, the new thing, the new thing that, that God has done is bring, given us Jesus. We regard no one according to the flesh. We don't pay attention to their nationality. We don't pay attention to their gender. We don't pay attention to how much money's in their pocket or what kind of car they drive. We don't pay attention to anything to do with, with who they are on the external. We, we don't regard Jesus this way anymore. We don't we don't look for him just because he gives us stuff or just because he can do amazing things, that he can shock us and wow us with the physics of our, of our world. We regard him not these ways anymore. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. They, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, not, not an improvement on the old, not a better version of what you used to be, a new creation, a new person, a new entity, a new, a new self that is not regarded according to the flesh, according to your, to your sex, according to your height, according to anything to do with what you are on the external, but only because you are in Christ. That is the only, the only distinction. The old has passed away. Behold, the new is coming. No, the new has come. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. To be reconciled is what happened when the Son came home to the Father. That relationship that had been broken became new. It was no longer like it was when he was growing up as a boy. Parents, your children 
your relationship with your children will have to become new. It cannot be an improvement on the old. As your children grow up, you have a new relationship with them. It is something different. It is something that recognizes the old, but it, but it is something completely different. It is compl something completely new and valuable. It has to become something new. The old has gone, the new has come. This reconciliation uh, between the father and the son, that's what, that's what Jesus affords. It's not by uh, our, our, our reconnection with God is not because we tried harder. It's not because we, we made a better resolution this time around. It's not because we, we were more successful at keeping sin at bay. It's because of Jesus. And only because of Jesus, reconciliation is even possible. That, that we are able to be changed and become new is even possible because of Jesus. And then when that happens, when we become reconciled with God, we then become ambassadors, not substitutes, not replacements, but ambassadors to tell other people that this kind of reconciliation, this kind of complete transformation is possible, and that it's possible through Jesus. Therefore, we as ambassadors for Christ God makes his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. My job as a pastor is to tell you that that is possible, to be reconciled to God because of Jesus. Your job as a follower of Christ is to tell people that it is possible to be reconciled with God through Christ. It is a new thing that happens. It's something that is unfathomable, but it's possible. So I challenge you with these things said to ask yourself, what is the thing that I'm holding on to that's keeping me from, from taking this new blessing? Am I still looking for manna when Jesus is standing in front of me? Am I still holding on to, to bitterness and wanting things to stay the same when God is offering to do a new thing to the people's lives around me or in my own life? And then ask yourself that and ask God what new thing do you want to do with me? What new thing do you want to do in my life? May God bless you all.